Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Gauri Bhide and I'm a medical oncologist, which means that I treat patients who have cancer. I have found that a lot of my patients take a lot of supplements. So I started a series looking at the science behind the benefits of taking these supplements. We are continuing the series today, but I'm only presenting an overview, not all the individual papers from which I collected this information, because that would just turn into a very long, dull, boring medical school lecture. The purpose of my presentation is to disseminate useful, practical information, information that might help you lead a more healthful life. I get no financial benefit from this presentation or from the companies that manufacture these supplements. Today, we are going to talk about a vitamin that's not really a vitamin, it's vitamin D. Structurally and functionally, it actually behaves more like a steroid hormone. What is the difference? The, very simply put, a vitamin actually participates in an enzymatic reaction, a biochemical reaction to effect a certain outcome, whereas a hormone circulates, binds to the receptor, and then sends signals to the receptor to effect the changes that it wants to make. I am going to start with a note of caution though, because many people take a number of different supplements and each supplement may contain some amount of vitamin D and if you total it all up, it, you may be getting toxic doses. Vitamin D is not water soluble, like vitamin C or vitamin B, and you can't just pee it out. It is fat soluble and so it go, gets stored in your fatty tissue and can, cause you to have very toxic levels of vitamin D. Very high levels can mess up your calcium metabolism and can lead to a lot of medical problems, including kidney failure. So do be cautious and mind the levels. How much should you take? The recommended daily allowance is 400 units for infants up to one year, 600 units for adults up to age 70 and 800 units for more than 70 years of age. Now, in some medical conditions, your doctor may prescribe very large doses of vitamin D, particularly if you have uh, severe inflammatory conditions causing malabsorption or some other diseases. But when you take very high levels of vitamin D, your blood levels need to be monitored. There are two main sources of natural vitamin D. One is uh, through our diet, but that only provides less than 10% of our intake. And the majority is made by our own body through a series of reactions, which we'll go into. There are two forms of dietary vitamin D, D2 or ergocalciferol, which is mainly extracted from a mushroom that had never really heard of or uh, used uh, before I started this research, the maitake mushroom, which is extensively used in the Far East, and portobello mushroom, which I use all the time. There are a few other sources of uh, vegetarian vitamin uh, D, but they are really minimal. D3 comes from animal sources like cheese, cod liver oil, egg yolks, and fatty fish like salmon. The main source of our body's uh, requirement comes from the series of reactions which start in the skin. Our skin stores a compound called 7-dehydrocholesterol. The UV rays from the sun change that to a pre-vitamin D and then to D3, which gets into your circulation. It reaches the liver, the liver changes it to a 25-hydroxy D3, and then it sends it to the kidney, which makes it the final 125-hydroxy D3, also known as calcitriol commonly. This then travels to the entire body, and it affects the function of many different cells by binding to a nuclear receptor uh, called the vitamin D receptor. And this interaction with the receptor produces signals for the cell to perform its desired function. So the sun, the skin, the liver, and the kidney have to perform their function very well for us to reap the benefits of vitamin D. 
as you know, there is much more sunlight year round in the equatorial regions. So to protect our ancestors from making too much vitamin D, the skin started making a pigment called melanin, which blocks the effect of the sun. As some of our ancestors migrated away from the equator uh, towards regions which had very little sun or uh, not, no sun year round, uh, they lost the melanin in their skin so that they could make as much vitamin D3 as their climate would allow. Now we have migrated to many different parts of the earth but our metabolism retains our evolutionary history. So people with a lot of melanin who live in colder climates, like myself, have developed vitamin D deficiency. And people who have little melanin who now live in warm sunny climates, for example, Australia, have to worry about sunburn. How do we protect ourselves from the bad effects of the sun? Clothing and sunscreen can decrease the effect of the sun's action. Sunscreen is necessary to protect us from sun, skin cancer, but sunscreens uh, that only block UVA will still allow UVB to get through and that will have the desired effect on D3 manufacture. And studies do show that even with sunscreen use, there is enough vitamin D synthesis. But it only takes about 10 to 15 minutes of sun exposure to produce the necessary manufacture of D3. However, measuring vitamin D levels is the only way of knowing whether we have enough or too much. And it is important to take vitamin D3 in the correct doses to find that balance. Since the vitamin D receptor is present in a lot of different tissues, the active vitamin D or calcitriol actually does have an effect on most organs, but the main effect that we see are on the intestines, the bones, and our immunity. In the gut, it facilitates the absorption of calcium. Calcium is a critical element in our neurophysiology and our electrophysiology. It is vital to keep our nerves and our muscles functioning well, among other functions and calcitriol, that is the active vitamin D, is important in its absorption and its regulation. In the bones, it affects bone development and bone remodeling. Vitamin D deficiency causes a disease called rickets, where the bones become soft and bowed, and uh, we have avoided it in developed countries by fortifi fortifying our foods with vitamin D in developing countries or in malnourished societies, rickets remains a big problem. At the other end of life, vitamin D is important to protect us from osteoporosis and fractures. The effect on immunity is multifold. It acts both as an anti-inflammatory agent as well as an anti-infectious agent. In fact, there was a study which showed a significant benefit of adding vitamin D compared to a placebo to patients who are being treated for tuberculosis and it improved the clearing of this infection. Vitamin D enhances the immune response that is produced by neutrophils, macrophages, and monocytes. The adaptive response involves activating B cells and T cells. In healthy people, T cells are critical in fighting infections. But in autoimmune conditions or diseases that cause or are caused by chronic inflammation, this activation can attack the body's own tissue. Vitamin D has important gene regulatory actions in T cells, and this modulates the activity of T cells, which ends up protecting the body against some autoimmune conditions or chronic inflammatory conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and it has shown benefit even in conditions like type 2 diabetes and cancer. Studies have shown that low levels of vitamin D are associated with susceptibility to infection, immune-related disorders, respiratory infections, as well as asthma or COPD. So it truly is an important supplement to maintain healthy functioning lungs. And then finally, especially in my field, cancer, multiple studies have shown that in patients with cancer, T 
Taking vitamin D improves survival. The main benefit is seen in breast, prostate, and colon cancer, but that's also because the numbers of those patients are so large. The vitamin D receptor is seen in such a variety of cancers that its benefit is likely seen in a large variety of cancers. It acts uh, as an anti-cancer agent by decreasing the growth of cancer cells, by increasing the programmed cell death or apoptosis, and it also acts as an anti-angiogenic agent, which means that it starves the tumor of new blood vessel supply. Much more research is required to uh, find out what the optimal dose is and what duration of uh, vitamin D supplementation is required to optimize or to get the maximum benefit of vitamin D supplementation in cancer patients. So we have seen with all this research that vitamin D is a powerhouse of beneficial effects and most of us would benefit from a daily supply of vitamin D. But we have to be careful about monitoring our doses because too much of a good thing is a bad thing. I hope you found this information useful. Thank you for tuning in and be in good health.